Public discourse shapes what people believe and has the power to drive individuals into action. James Baldwin's prose and practice embodies this notion. What you've just witnessed here was a snippet of how James Baldwin leveraged the, writ the written word and the spoken word to grasp at the angst most of us hold long enough just to agitate even the most jaded or, or adversarial opponent. For far too many of us, it is not difficult to imagine what it feels like to enter a room full of people who don't look or think as you do. For Baldwin, on that day, entering the belly of the beast seemed all too familiar. I imagine that his roots right here in Harlem and the greater New York City prepared him for the day he met and debated William F. Buckley, Jr. And of course, no less than at Cambridge University. Baldwin beat Buckley that day. The topic, the American dream is at the expense of the American Negro. The yeas outpolled the nays 540 to 160. <laughs> to publicly debate is to wrestle with words and ideas. Public debate forces us to contend with assumptions held by our audience and opponents. Debate is theater. Baldwin understood this and delivered a performance that shook the foundation of anti-blackness, homophobia, and imperialism in the halls of Cambridge University and within the minds of all who view the debate. This debate illustrated his skill for storytelling. In it, he also said, from a very literal point of view, the harbors and the ports and the railroads of the country, the economy, especially in the South, could not conceivably be what they are if it had not been, and this is still so, for cheap labor. I am speaking very seriously, and this is not an overstatement. I picked cotton, I carried it to the market, I built the railroads under someone else's whip for nothing for nothing. The Southern oligarchy, which has still today so very much power in Washington, and therefore some power in the world, was created by my labor and my sweat, and the violation of my women and the murder of my children. This in the land of the free and the home of the brave. While Baldwin's life and work embodied so much of the promise of a society built for all, so much of what we continue to fight today, his opponent, William Buckley, founder of the National Review, is also recognized as the father of modern day conservatism. His legacy embodies the vitriol and violence that lingers today in US politics. It finds comfort in a suit khakis, polos, and tiki torches. And yes, even in cars that they use to kill. Buckley's ideas, however, have never left this country. They have perhaps awakened from a slumber where they once hibernated with the shame, the shame that has now been washed away by the 2016 presidential election. Yes? From the White House to Charlottesville, they carry no shame today. Their violence is validated through both rhetoric and through public policy. <coughs> All white supremacy is violent. There is no such thing as nonviolent white supremacy. Nonviolent white nationalism is impossible. Both white supremacy and white nationalism are inherently violent. Our call is to combat them in every space possible. Baldwin's legacy lives among each of us in this room who showed up today. Who showed up today because we believe in the fight for black people to be free and to live within our full dignity. That night, Baldwin won for himself 
and for all of us. Our public discourse and action must call out the danger of white supremacy and its roommates. Patriarchy, classism, ableism, transphobia, and homophobia. It was no accident that one of the most compelling public dialogues to happen within the tradition of the black radical tradition was between a black lesbian and a black gay man. Audrey Lord and James Baldwin. Each of these debates sorely, much like those raised in the conversation between Baldwin and Buckley, remain debates even today within our own communities. Let us do the work to win those debates and be on the right side of history. It starts by simply committing to a politic that creates dignity for all. And while black feminism teaches us that the personal is indeed political, it also teaches us that the political requires action. This is not easy work. And there have been more times than one where I have become speechless and overwhelmed. However, again, as Audre Lorde, whose discourse with Baldwin we have shared today, I understand that while my silence at times may be convenient, it will not protect me. And, as she also rightly asserts, our struggle is not a single issue, right? Because we do not live single issue lives. Baldwin did not live a single issue life, right? And like Baldwin, in that debate on that night at Cambridge, where he entered a room full of white men who would go on to do many things, he was on the right side of history. Let us all be on the right side of history in this moment, even when it is uncomfortable. And I know that a lot of things are uncomfortable, but it is within that discomfort that we move ourselves and we can move each other. Our personal politics are as good as public action. Let us be thinkers and doers. Baldwin was a thinker and a doer. Let us do the work of thinking and doing for the sake of our collective liberation in this lifetime. For as Baldwin's contemporary Fannie Lou Hamer said, nobody is free until everybody is free. And I would imagine that Baldwin would agree. Thank you. <laughs>